National Fire Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to the National Fire Radio podcast where we are releasing daily episodes Monday through Friday. Conversations with people that are in love with this job. We talk about the highs and the lows and everything in between. But if you're here listening and part of the National Fire Radio community and you're checking out this podcast, whether it's your first episode or you're all the way in on a hundred and something episodes by now and you're bought into it, we appreciate you. We appreciate you being part of the community and constantly coming back and listening to the podcast. Welcome. Enjoy the word. And for us to be able to do this and deliver this to you every day, we need the help of some sponsors. And these sponsors are partners where we do collaboration work and they allow us to put forth great content with great guests so that we can keep pushing this job forward. So before we hop into the episode, a quick word from some of our sponsors. Taylor's Tins. Taylor and his team have been manufacturing aluminum helmet fronts since 2017 with over 200,000 shields in the market. Taylor's Tins is a leader in the American Fire Service helmet front space. Not only do they manufacture helmet fronts, but they do so much more. Locker tags, key chains, CO monitor charts, medical kit charts, pump charts, banquet awards, you name it, they do it. Go over to taylorstins.com and check out what they can offer you today. They've become a longtime sponsor and good friend of the National Fire Radio podcast, and because of that, They offer a promo code at checkout. So when you go to taylorstins.com, enter NFR sent me. That is NFR sent me, and you'll get 15% off your checked out order. It works on all stock items from taylorstins.com, including quick tins, license plates, locker tags, and much, much more. Exclusions do apply. This is a company that prides themselves on quality and customer service. From the inception, from your design to out the door, it's within 48 hours. Nobody else is doing that. They can't do that. 48 hours to get your shield out the door to you to put it on your helmet and get to the next job. Anyway, check out taylorstins.com. Again, that's taylorstins.com. Check out their latest offerings and use promo code NFR sent me. That's NFR sent me for 15% off on your checkout. And in the words of Taylor and his crew, stop burning up leather. Hey everyone, Jeremy, National Fire Radio, back on the podcast today. Today Today's going to be a fun one. This is a guy who shook his hand down in Westchester, Pennsylvania at a training event. He's highly regarded by a lot of good friends of mine, and I really haven't had the chance to meet him until today. And so on the podcast today, retired, newly retired, Chief of Department Joe Palumbo out of Pennsauk in New Jersey. Chief, thanks for joining me, brother. Thank you for having me, sir. I appreciate it very much. This is very cool, man. I love when guys that I know say, you got to talk to this guy. You got to talk to this guy. This guy's great. He's got a good story. He's got a good message. And so following up on those leads, man, and then, you know, developing my own relationship and and so on with people, it's just a lot of fun. But it's an absolute honor to have you on the uh, episode today. And I'm looking forward to hearing about your story. So I did say newly retired, December 30th. You had a walkout ceremony in Pensauk, and tell me what that felt like. Uh, nervous <laughs> in uh, anticipation in the uh, the months and you know weeks sure. and as the days neared, uh, but I could not, uh, in retrospect, be more thankful for the members of the department and what they did uh, to you know regard me, uh, but mo- more importantly, my family. It was it was uh, quite literally the one of the best days of my career. Wow. That's huge. I mean, you, you see all the time on social media and the news where, where guys are doing walkout ceremonies. Not everybody gets a walkout ceremony. You know, usually it's geared towards people that have been highly effective in their careers, people that made an impact on their organization. And I know talking with uh, mutual friends, people that used to work for you, people that do work for you, uh, and friends of yours, I know how influential you were in a lot of people's careers and also the structuring and building of the Pensauk and New Jersey Fire Department. Because over your tenure, there's been a tremendous amount of change. Uh, quite a bit. Yeah, we've evolved <laughs> quite a bit in the uh, in the last 12 years, uh, to say the least. So volunteered first off, right? So you were a volunteer in the, in the municipality back in 94. From there, you, you become a firefighter at the Atlantic City Airport, which was for a quick stint. Came back for EMS in Pensauken. And then you get hired in uh, 2000 in Pensauken, correct? That's correct. Yeah, September of 2000, I was appointed to the department. 
So what I what strikes a chord with me and something that resonates with me very heavily was how involved your your name, your family, you, uh, your your siblings, and everyone else is involved in your town. I grew up in my hometown as a volunteer firefighter, where I still am. And my father was a firefighter, my brothers, but not only that, my father was a councilman, he was a mayor, um, and all those things. So I am very, I am very well rooted in my hometown community as well, and I feel like you were as, as well, right? Uh, yeah, I was uh, born and raised in Pensalkin, and uh, I was blessed to have uh, selected, and I spoke uh, briefly about this, uh, the, the fire company that I joined uh, I could not have been happier in retrospect. Very proud to uh, have my name, uh, my family's name amongst uh, some really big names in Pensacola Fire Department history that uh, that adorn the walls of that firehouse. It's it's quite an honor. How did you find your way there in '94? Uh, it was quite literally uh, the, in the years previous to that. It was uh, it was the, quite literally the only place that hosted a, uh, a fire explorer program or a junior firefighter program. Oh, interesting. And uh, I was there for a brief period of time. And then uh, I had uh, cousins that were members of a small town fire department, not knowing the rivalry that existed in uh, the volunteer fire service at the time, and uh, decided to go for a couple of years and, and join that department and only to find my way back. Uh, uh, in 1994, Pensalkin had a run of fire duty in the summer of 94 that, uh, you know, being a an 18 year old, 19 year old kid in a uh, in a small town fire department that right. you know good people, but really didn't offer their firefighters much as far as the ability to uh, to develop pedigree. Uh, and I was watching these guys go to fire after fire in that summer of '94, and decided to make the move. And it was the you know the best thing I ever decided to do. That's cool. I mean, everybody loves a department that goes to work, right? Because yeah. when you, when you come in at young and you're impressionable, and that is your first exposure to the fire service where fire duty is on the norm, man, does that really in, ingrain in you? No. Yeah, it was. Uh, it, you know, it was. I I went to a funeral luncheon for uh, one of my aunts, and uh, it was in in the fire station that I decided to join, and. Uh, the, the full-time firefighter, we call him houseman at the time, we, you know, he basically said, you know, the door's open when you're coming back. And uh, nice. it's, the guy turned out to be one of the uh, one of the great mentors of my life and uh, just a, a monster in the fire service uh, for me amongst uh, uh, quite a few others that uh, developed over time. But so thankful that I made that uh, that transition to Pensalkin in 1994. Yeah, I, I'm sure. And then look at the longevity, right? I mean, you walked out of there in 2022, all those years later as the chief of department. Take me through a little bit about that process, right? So, you know, 94, you, you walk in, you find your home there, you start going to fires. Obviously, you get that, you're bitten, man, and, and firefighting is what you want to do. What, at the time, you mentioned Houseman. What was the makeup of, of your local community then? So you had... Uh, guys within the department already that were paid and then they were supplemented by volunteers? Yeah, uh, Pensalkin uh, the, started the fire service in Pensalkin in 1913 in the garage of a, a, a gentleman named Oswald Weiss in a neighborhood called East Pensalkin. And uh, through those uh, World War One years developed, uh, you know, second and third fire companies, a lot of them, the genesis was uh, these home guard concepts during, during World War One. Yeah. And uh, by... The, the mid thirties, there were seven volunteer fire companies in Pensalkin in a 12 and a half square mile community with uh, not a whole lot of population density at the time. And uh, two of the fire companies merged and for up until 2000, uh, there were six fire stations in Pensalkin, six volunteer fire companies. And in 1943, the uh, in the couple years leading up to 1943, some of the fire companies compensated uh, one firefighter uh, that was a volunteer to serve as a houseman, and they worked seven. Uh, they worked six out of the seven days a week. They only had off on Sunday. Mm. And in 1943, uh, the municipality hired them as reserve police officers okay. and assigned uh, assigned them to the fire stations. And by the time I got on. On the department, uh, we had six full-time firefighters, one assigned to each fire station, and then four assigned to the Bureau of Fire Prevention, 
and the construction office. Okay. And so what their responsibility then was just to get the piece to the scene, initiate the it, beginning steps of firefighting, and then it would be offset by guys responding in in their personal vehicles, running around the corner from their local store or whatever, right, and supplement the... Yeah, yeah. There, there would be ebbs and flows of participation. You know, most days you were going by yourself, but you go to the north end of town, and that first rig would turn out with three or four guys on it. Right. Uh, it, but it, it wasn't consistent. And uh, you would quite literally find yourself going to a fire by yourself, praying that people were coming behind you. It's a wild, wild setup, but it is very common for this type of firefighting across the country. You uh, know? I, I, I watched it this morning. Uh, the grounds crew for the Super Bowl had 31 guys assigned to it. Yet most fire departments, especially municipal departments, in this area in the Northeast still find themselves challenged to put, you know, four firefighters on a rig. It's crazy. It's, it is crazy. I agree with you hundred percent. It goes back to the same thing too, where, you know, the, the least paid people on the field that day uh, with the Buffalo Bills guy that, that died on the field where the EMTs that saved his life. You know what I, I mean? I couldn't, it's, yeah. It's, it was evident last night when they welcomed all those folks at the beginning uh, of the game. Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely, man. And it's just, but for that then, I mean, for you to recognize that, for you to come home, you left, you came back home, now you get hired in the department that you began volunteering for. I mean, that had to be a very proud moment for you too, right? Because you came home. Uh, it was uh, it was pretty amazing. I mean, you know, if, if you look at my road, I'm sure it's synonymous with a lot of guys. I met my wife through uh, her uncle, who was a fireman in the Bloomfield Park Fire Company that I joined as a volunteer here in Pensalkin. And uh, we bought our house in the neighborhood where the firehouse was for that very reason. And uh, here I am today, 24 years later, still living in the same house in the same town, uh, but with a whole, a whole broader perspective on the fire department than I ever had before. So did you ever envision yourself being, I mean, you are the first career chief, correct? So you guys had, you guys had a fire director or public safety director prior. Uh, Yeah, we had a, uh, a, a, the transition from uh, volunteer leadership to career leadership was a pretty rocky road for us for between 2004 and 2009. There were some destructive forces at play uh, really changed the dynamic of the fire service in Pensalkin. And we were able to, recover from what we call some pretty dark years here uh but that was yeah there was a uh a civilian uh two civilians in charge of the fire department one came they both came from the department ranks as volunteers and it just took us a while to uh reconcile that and put the department on the right track so let me ask you when that when that all began right so i'm looking at um in 2004 that was the time that you guys fully staffed your first company is that uh, 2004? Yeah, but it was only on a limited scope. So uh, we from uh, we went to a 12 hour shift with four members on one engine company, and all the satellite fire stations remained staffed at one. Okay, so then break this down for me a little bit, if we can dive into this, because I think this yeah, is where this conversation between you and I is going to bring a tremendous amount of value. We have so many volunteer fire companies that are out there. Uh, that are struggling and we have to look at alternative methods and ideas of how we can sustain while providing the correct amount of protection and responsibility and, and the expected responsibility we carry for the residents that we protect. And so you guys went through this uh, a while back. You were, I think, probably ahead of the curve only because of size and population and so on. So I'm just curious what that all looked like. You talked about some dark days and I know anytime there's change and transition, there's people that are always fighting for the opposite. And um, and I'm curious how that all went about for you guys, because I think that's where a lot of the value in today's conversation is going to come from, is what, you know, the experiences that you had and what that truly looked like and how the process worked. Can you kind of just take me down that road a little bit? I mean, somebody had to open the door and say, hey, we're falling down on our responsibilities or we're not able to provide the level of protection we should be. And so we need to look at starting to put more people on. I would assume that's how it began. Yeah, it, it wasn't as academic as, as you would think. We mm. had a, a fire protection study commission for the department in 2002 that kind of gave us this boilerplate. Yeah. Uh, and it really, we really only ever adhered to about 50% of the report because by the time we had to enact some major changes, we were well past the needs that were identified in that report. I get it. So again, it wasn't as academic as as you would think. It was more trial and error. Uh, it got to the point where there were days uh, where we couldn't even put a rig on the street. 
Mm. And we relied on automatic aid as in, as embarrassing as that it could be for a department. I think it was something that we had to experience until we, and until we truly dug in and it wasn't uh, without the efforts of the members of the department as limited as they were at that time uh, to the elected officials in the town to actually uh, completely support uh, the roadmap that we, we decided to put into place. But uh, again, I, I liken those, those 2004 to 2009, some pretty dark years for the department transition from a chief that was uh, hopeful to unify the department to a civilian uh, and then only to find us losing 135 volunteer firefighters in those years. Oh, wow. Uh, wow. And that's significant. It's measurable. It's, it's verifiable. And uh, it, if, if you look at it, that's where I liken it to some pretty destructive times. Yeah. And so we ended up uh, going on um, a, a Monday, a seven day schedule, 12 hour shifts with one staff company augmented by the volunteer personnel at nights and on the weekends. Uh, back to a Monday to Friday schedule that was a punitive step uh, against the, the the members of the, the, the full time members of the department, mm. and then only to find us in 2009 holding uh, this leaking bag of shit for lack of a better word. <laughs> no, I and, get it. Uh, yeah, and uh, it, I don't know that we uh, were in a darker place than we w- we found ourselves in around February of 09. It so took. We decided, okay. we decided to dig in, and it took a lot of. Uh, a lot of time away from our families. Who and decided? A lot of it, this is this again? is who decided because like this is part of this is part of like the struggles that I deal with. Right? Is like when we look at models like this, like we're we're starting to deal with this in my home department, and so I'm like, hey, it's time. Like we need to figure out where we are right now so we can address. We we can't address the future without knowing where we are today. And when we're starting to fall down and struggle, one the hardest part for any organization, I think, is is to take an internal look at themselves and say we are falling down on our duties and responsibilities, right? And and so where? Where does that conversation come from? Because, you know, you say we, 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 but there has to be a catalyst. Is that the, the volunteer firefighters? Or, I mean, you lost such a significant amount of them over those dark days. Where did that look come from to say we need to do better and we need the town to sign on board? Because you're a municipal department, right? You're not a district. That's correct. Yeah, right? that's correct. I, I, yeah, I... I, I... I try not to be uh, singular in my representation. No, of, no, no. I understand. Yeah. I understand. It was, it you don't was, need to name the individual, but I'm saying no, it's okay. Yeah. Well, Go ahead. It was it was quite literally a core yeah. of, of, of probably about 12 to 15 members of the department from different walks. Got it. Uh, we were able to get back some folks that had left. Yeah. Uh, but it was a group of younger guys, my age at the time, guys that I went to school with. Some of them were second generation members of the department. Yeah. Uh, we were, you know, guided by a mentor who had name, you know, lineage to the uh, origination of that first fire company. It's important. About. Yeah. Uh, and we just decided to dig in and uh, not everything we tried worked, but putting apparatus on the street that were staffed by, you know, competent and qualified uh, personnel was the only priority uh, yeah. and that lives to this day is you know we have to be firemen first we have to be competent at what we're doing before we can take on any other mission and did, did you find that that core group the the group that you're in was it because you had such buy-in because you were just enamored with the Pensacola fire department and that you didn't want to see that get destroyed? I mean, how much, like what played in your mind with this process? Because it's so easy to just say F it and walk away because it's just stressful and you might not get to where you want to be and what you envision. Like there's got to be a lot of ups and downs personally for you involved in the process. No. Uh, yeah. And you know, uh, I I'll say to this day, I said it, uh, the day that I left, uh, the only, the only reason I was able to be successful in this was I had a good girl at home that yeah, was completely supportive huge. of what I did. And, yeah. and, uh, she, my wife quite literally took a backseat to this department, uh, for a number of years. And, uh, I, I, lucky that, people. that is, that is singular. That's a singular, uh, yes. key to success for any, anybody at, right. at that level. Uh but I think what we were really, you know, being completely honest is that we were embarrassed. We were embarrassed uh, where we were as an organization. We were embarrassed uh, to work with our counterparts and not be able to produce, you know, uh, companies that had 
you know, reliable people on them. And we were losing our relevance to the community. And uh, we that was what we strive to be is relevant and relied upon by not only the leaders of the town, but the people of the town. And I think that's quite literally where we are today is, uh, is we have an impact on our community and we're relevant. Again, the department has such tremendous history. If you look at the the, the, the fire companies that we had trouble with or the personnel that we had trouble with, generations and generations of, of men had served these fire companies well before the people that were contrarians or the people that caused us trouble. Yeah. And we had to honor them by just forging ahead. Damn. And uh, it took a lot of uh, fortitude and a lot of bad days and a lot of lessons learned. Uh, and I, I know I'm painting with a broad brush here, but no, uh, I am sitting back like I'm literally taking notes as this is killer. This is what I was where I was hoping you were going to take this because the value you're bringing right now to so many people that are sitting in that seat where you were in 20 in 2009. There's so many people right now that are going to listen to this episode and be right there and feel the emotion of what you're talking about. It absolutely matters. And this is why we talk a lot about tradition and knowing where you come from you have to know where you come from in your roots and you have to protect them in order to move forward and i think that's so important in hearing you talk about the history and naming dates and names and people and companies that stuff matters chief it matters it does yeah you have to be a student of the history of the organization if if the organization is going to be important to you that's that's my take from it is i belong to one fire company i never belong to any other fire company in pensalkin but you have to know the history of them all so you can stand in front of these folks and uh, speak to the need for change or why this fire company is transitioning down a dark place or yeah. is no longer needed and why we have to reduce our uniform force or why we have to reduce our, our apparatus or our number of stations. And you have to be able to speak to those details to carry that message through. How hard was it for you? I mean, I'm looking at the chronological order here. I made some notes, right? So um, 2005 as a lieutenant, 2009 as a battalion chief, 2011 you become chief of the department. So you're literally in a important role during those transition years. I mean, you are directly handcrafting and being a part of trying to fix what's not working. And so – the stress that comes along is that's huge, but it's a municipal fire department. So now you have to educate, not only take the the people that you work with on a daily basis, volunteer and careers, and, and make that work, right? But then you also have to work with council people and your mayor to, repre to get a budget that's representative of what you need and how you feel you need to proceed. How challenging was that? Uh, it just took time. And yeah. it took uh, regurgitation of uh, metrics and the fact that our department is uh, busier than we've ever been before. Uh, when I joined, again, the fire department in 1994, uh, I joined the smallest geographical response area. The fire company had the smallest response area in the town. And if you didn't take, if you took away the second company runs, the second do runs and automatic aid, we probably only had... 150 runs in that local maybe and uh, probably a thousand to 1100 runs a year throughout the entire township and back then you would be in a fire station in the south end of town uh, south end of town why uh, while if uh, a company was on a, uh, a you know a two and one house fire in the north end of town you wouldn't even relocate you wouldn't even move to the fire you wouldn't even be operating on the fire ground yeah wow and uh now uh you know last year we did uh 2400 runs uh the fire duty is up the population density drives that all those factors and uh it was just through showing the elected officials to get their support and we've been incredibly well supported by the, those folks yeah. through two different generations of elected officials um, because we've stayed true to our word, we've delivered on our promises and, uh, we've, we've, you know, right sized the department to, uh, to where we need to be now. And, uh, you know, we're not quite there yet. I mean, it was our goal. Uh, it was my personal goal to get to a second staffed company. Uh, we're there, but we're not there with, uh, with full-time personnel. We're there through a combination of volunteer and full-time personnel and it works. It's not perfect, but uh, we have one staff company 24 hours a day, 
and a, a second company that is is staffed, but it's staffed Monday to Friday with full time personnel, and on the weekends and, and at night with volunteer personnel. Okay, and so the reason why I asked about the elected side of things with with working with a uh, municipality is sometimes your hands can be tied there too, and it takes time. And um, I think what what the way you said it was best was that you had to give them the metrics. And I think a lot of times in order to affect change, we have to have people in those positions that are affecting that change that are doing the homework to support the mission. It's easy to say this is the mission, but if you can't back it up and sell it, package it, sell it, and then follow through, like you said, they trusted you and you guys delivered. That is huge. And you signed your name to that chief, right? I mean, your name's on that. Yeah, and, and it, it, it was more than just uh, response metrics or what we could throw right, down right, on apparatus. Right. It was, uh, you know, a, an evolution of the fire department budget. It was, re- you know, we had 13 Class A pumpers in the department, two aerials, uh, you know, two rescue squad vehicles, and then a handful of utility and support command vehicles. And, we, you know, the, one of our number one priorities was to downsize that. And there was a department that used to exist one day, you know, when I joined that had 300 volunteers and 10 full-time personnel that could put that apparatus on the street. And we could no longer do that. So, uh, you know, additionally, we we had to uh, purchase, the municipality had to purchase the volunteer fire stations and, and transfer those real and personal assets from the fire companies to the municipality and uh, eliminate, you know, the fundraising efforts that were commensurate with a volunteer fire company owning their buildings and it was just a tremendous amount of administrative work that a lot of folks never saw. Yeah. But what it what it really did was legitimize the department's uh, existence and uh, gave us facilities that we could then invest in with municipal dollars to uh, to bring up the speed. You know, a, a building that was built in 1938 was 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 suffering terribly from you know the roots to the roof, and uh, we were able to renovate a lot of the fire stations and and bring them up to functional buildings that are you know, uh, in, relevant or uh, in neighborhoods that are, you know, uh, relevant to those neighborhoods and not on a commercial thoroughfare or an industrial area that are out of sight. You know, our fire stations are in the neighborhoods. And uh, again, it was just a, a tremendous amount of administrative work in the background, but very rewarding. Well, and, that, and yeah, very rewarding. I can only imagine, especially for a gentleman like yourself that is heavily entrenched in the community. Your name is assigned to, you know, the names of the Pennsauken Fire Department. And so for you to walk around with that gold badge, 2011, you get named the first career fire chief. What did that mean to you? Uh, it's a great question. And uh, if uh, in full transparency, I didn't know what I didn't know. And mm. uh, I did not completely understand what I was getting into as much as I wanted to see the fire department move forward. And uh there's a benefit to trial by fire and there's a benefit to an academic preparation. And I didn't have the academic preparation. So a lot of our lessons learned, uh, were, were born through trial and uh, trial by fire. And, um, it was incredibly rewarding, but if I look back on it now, I would never, I would never recommend anyone to spend half their career in the role that I had because it takes its toll on you. And, uh, you know, I gleaned that from Mike Nasty's uh, pres- uh, podcast mm. with you that at times you have to turn this place off. And it was very hard. It, it was always very hard for me to do that. Well, especially and, when you live right down the road. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I literally live a block and a half yeah. from the fire station. So, uh, but it was, uh, it was incredible, but it took its toll on you. That's yeah. for sure. And, and I'm nope. sure, yeah, and I'm sure those those foundational years of going through that change and and watching the department, uh, you know, I'm looking at um, I'm just trying to go over some of my notes here, and you know, the way that the the one article put it, I did a little you know reading and follow up just about you and so on, and um, it just what they talked about of of the uh, your work dedicated to the department and and facilitating some of the biggest challenges in the history of the Pennsylvania fire department went through on your watch. And that is, I mean, that is all in, right? I mean, you can't step away from that. And, uh, and for you to, to recognize that and understand that, um, is I'm sure hard and, 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 uh, tough all in the same breath, I'm sure. 
But what did it do for you? I mean, outside of the the struggles and the, and all of that, I mean, your son is now a firefighter in Pensalkin. I mean, that's got to be a very proud moment for you. Uh, incredibly, yeah. Uh, I never had the outlet that uh, that he had. I I always wanted to be a fireman. I came from a family of police officers on my grandmother's side. Um, my cousin is a lieutenant in Philadelphia. My brother in law is on the job with us. Just got promoted, and my son started riding at the fire station when he was 12 years old Wow! and he had an incredible outlet and, you know, Mooch and mules always yeah. short in, in his pockets to, to cover his portion of the meal, but the guys welcomed him, And uh, he joined the department in 2016 and was fortunate enough to uh, be appointed uh, in, uh, in 2019 in August and starts his fifth year uh, coming up here. That's got to be exciting. Uh, very proud. Incredibly proud. Incredibly yeah, I, proud. I think it's really interesting. I always end the podcast with, or I've been lately ending the podcast asking guys about legacy and what that means to them and so on. And I, I read, I just want to read something. I read this to you in the pre-show, and I just want to read it now. And I really just want to just get your take on it, right? It, you said in an article that I read online about your retirement and so on, Joseph, who's your son? Joseph, okay. you're a better firefighter than I could ever hope to be, and that's my legacy. That's huge. Like, that is powerful, right? I mean, to to watch the foundation that you laid. I mean, you, in 28-year career, you laid this foundation that your last name is an important name that's basically hung up in the rafters of the Pensacola Fire Department, and now your son, the next generation, is carrying on that last name for you. Legacy is super important. What is legacy to you? Uh, legacy to me is quite simply watching him and my brother-in-law uh, carry this this their work on in a, in a department that is totally different uh, in its optics from when I joined. Yeah, uh, I came from a department in a time where, and it wasn't malicious, but guys were oppressed or they were held back or they oh, weren't nur- they weren't they weren't nurtured. And uh, to me, uh, at 47 years old with the experience is that I've had in this department. Um, there's nothing better to me than seeing these guys succeed and carry this place on. And to watch my son have that, uh, that, that desire uh, is, is an operate in a department that is different uh, operate in a department that provides better opportunities, operate in a department that provides better access to development and to, operate in a department that is not only relevant to our community, but uh, we're counted on and relied upon by our, our counterparts, you know, as cheesy as that word is, by our departments that we go to mutual aid to and that come to here, come here to mutual aid. And yeah. uh, the relationships that he has developed on his own and that all these guys have developed uh, without me is, uh, is probably something that I'm most proud of. And uh, it's, he just gets the opportunity to work in a department that is different, but is the same name and, but, and but is you, in a much better place. You had every reason why he can do that. You were, I mean, I'm sitting here listening to your story and all of the struggles, the ups and downs, the ups and flows of taking a department and creating it to what it is today is really built on the back of the generations before him, but you in particular, because you've been able to facilitate that change. And you were the uh, the guy at the helm as this department navigated through these tough waters and then came out on the other side. And it seems like you guys are doing very well. I watch from afar. I don't know much about uh, Pensalkin and the Pensalkin Fire Department, but I know the, the engine company is a busy engine company. They go to work and they go to work regularly and they're well put together. I've seen a couple of your guys on the fire ground and they are very well put together. That's got to be very proud for you of all the struggles that you had along the way. And as you sit back now after retirement and think about all those struggles and and that burden that you took upon yourself and, and the others that, you know, carried the weight of that too, there has to be a lot of solace in all of that, though, that looking back. There, there uh, is. Yeah. And, and I have to say this over and over again. Uh, I was not alone. Uh, yeah, for have, sure. For sure. We, we have an incredible uh, – core of guys that are just all in some of them are first generation farm and some of them uh, are third and fourth generation farm and, and some of them are veterans and some of them are new and uh you know we we measure one's ability whether or not you actually care and uh so you know but that burden it now shifts right uh they're they are a busy company 
they are relied upon by the companies that we do mutual aid with, but they need to sustain that. And yeah. sustaining that is developing the folks that are now, uh, you know, we're a much younger organization than when I came on. Uh, I was I, at, at 25 years old, I was the youngest, uh, uh, the youngest fireman that was on the job and everybody else. Some of these guys are old enough to be my father. And now it's quite literally reversed. So now we have to, shift that 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 burden shifts to developing who's going to replace the guys that are there now and to make sure that they know how important it is to be students of the history of the department because there are people that are wearing our uniform today that weren't a part of the department between 2004 and 2009 and and don't even understand how formative those years were for us yeah and how much they they literally set set us on to this uh, catapulting uh, trajectory to where we are today speaks to culture, right? I mean, yeah, you know, it, yeah. it's in, so culture matters and the foundation of the call. I mean, it's so deeply rooted in the community with all these, what'd you say? 13 fire companies across the, the town at one point. No, right? I'm sorry. Yeah. There were, there were seven in a thir- roughly 13, 13 square mile okay. community. Yeah. So like we were literally on top of one another. These yeah, companies. Yeah. Which, which is a heavily rooted volunteer system, which is very prevalent across the country and, and how that plays out. Right. And so watching that change, but culture matters and not losing track of where we began and, and where we're going and to be a steward of that. I mean, that's important. That's important to educate. You bring up a very good point, man. Educating those that don't have any foundational roots, because if they don't get taught and they don't see the struggles and the value that came out of all those all those years of hard fought activities, that gets lost. We can't you can't lose that. Yeah, we we, we talk about those struggles anecdotally now, but the territorial differences between fire companies and where where uh, you know their first two area ended and began, and who didn't cross the double yellow line. And, <laughs> uh, but you know they have they have significance in, in how we operate today. They have significant they they have significance in how we identify response areas and you know whether you know a a, a, a a uh, box is dispatched in a specific area of town is still representative of that number of that fire company. You know what I mean? And so, yeah. uh, we, you know, if we go to a fire in that area, we'll talk anecdotally about what we used to experience, but during those times, it was incredibly frustrating. And, uh, I think there are markers for us is to, you know, there are markers for us to never go back to the way we used to operate, never go back, uh, to those times. But you, again, I, I sound like a broken record. No, no, to, no. You, you have good. to know how that was, you know, you have to remember, so for and, you then, I mean, uh, you said, I think you said you're 47. Is, is that 47? Yeah. 47. So you're a year older than me, by the way, just so you know. So 47 is still super young. So I find I'm 46 and I find that I'm the guy that always is bridging the gap between the young and old. I'm having those conversations between those grabbing those young guys and saying, you need to talk to this guy who's senior to me because I want you to understand what he went through and his stories and so on. And so that's what we're alluding to. Um, but for you with the, with the younger generation, your department is trending younger. That's becoming more and more of a struggle. I'm sure because as guys age off the job, we're finding less and less people there to keep explaining the stories, those anecdotal stories that need to, that need to happen. So do you find yourself, I know after retirement, I'm sure it was a struggle for you from all these years of going into the job to staying home that next morning. You find yourself finding your way back, having coffee any of these days, or the staying in touch. Like, what does that look like for you now? Uh, quite literally, just that. I, n- I never saw myself in that uh, in that mentor role or yeah. uh, the storyteller role. But uh, to me, that was what was most important about becoming an instructor at the Camden County Fire Academy. It okay. wasn't it wasn't the opportunity to teach as as much as I've I've uh, value and, and honor that opportunity. It was to actually stand alongside guys that I considered mentors, the guys mm. that I watched when I was a kid and say, what does it take to be an instructor here? Uh, you know, what is one's path to becoming that? You know, it was no different than when I was in the volunteer fire company. I'd be in the apparatus room as a fireman. And, and you know, uh, I said this when I left is uh, I'm so very proud of the fact that I joined a fire company that had uh, high expectations on its members. It awesome. demanded so much from their people. But I used to walk through the apparatus room as a kid and it's like, man, what does it take to become a captain at Bloomfield? You know what I mean? And uh, 
that's what I want to be to these guys today is, is to, I never saw myself in that role, but if I didn't, if I didn't uh, take on that role, then I'm doing a disservice to the people that I considered to be just that in my, in my last uh, couple weeks of work, uh, we hosted a few people that I truly value their friendship, uh, guys that I worked with guys that I grew up with. Um, and it was an opportunity for, uh, these guys to tell stories about their own departments, I love or that. My, my relationships with them. Mm. And, uh, I'll, I'll, something I'll remember for the rest of my life and, our guys just sat there and listened. There were there were a few questions. Yeah. There was you know we they there were little to no interruptions. It was just a lot of, you know, the cheesy words. It was a lot of active listening. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that has such value. And uh, I was there this morning, uh, right before I got on the show with you. Yeah. And, uh, just to have a cup of coffee and uh, shoot the breeze with the guys that were working. I mean, shooting the breeze is easy, but is it uncomfortable for you to be considered a mentor? It's it's more uncomfortable for me to let go. Ah, and, okay. Talk uh, about that. that. Talk about that. Well, you you spend twelve years of the of the twenty five uh, that I worked uh, in the role that I was in. It's it's and uh, I, you know, I use the word I. I try not to use it at all. I got it. And no uh, worries. It it becomes it's it's whether you're on vacation, uh, whether you're at your daughter's volleyball game or your son's baseball game, you're never off. Yeah. And the phone rings uh, constantly, whether it's someone reporting something to you or seeking your counsel on something that happened or something that's developing. Um, I have no regrets, but it's hard to let go. And I've watched so many guys uh, that were chief officers in, in, in my area, basically, and not a lot, very few. I, I shouldn't say so many. Uh, just a few guys that they they could not let go, and they could not un, uh, de-identify themselves and become a mentor. And they became a you know you know in varying levels destructive forces within those fire departments because they couldn't let go and they couldn't become supportive to the chief uh, that replaced them. And that's what I want. My commitment is to the guys that are uh, that have replaced. Uh, that have replaced me and the guys that are going to carry this place on is to be, uh, you know, quite literally a, a guy, a guidance counselor to them. And uh, so, no, I never saw myself as a mentor and, and I, I'm very proud of the opportunity to be just that to them. I hope I fulfill it. I hope I satisfy what, whatever expectations they have of me. Very well said. Very, very well said. I Good for you, man. And and for you to come back and be able, it can't be the easiest thing. It's transitioning from your every day to now walking in, not as a guest, but you're sitting down and having a cup of coffee and, and shooting a breeze for a little bit. And then the bells go off and they run out and you're still sitting there, right? It can't be, it can't be easy for you to walk back through that threshold, but the, the, the understanding that, you're there for still an, an important reason, um, I think probably helps with that process. I'm going to try to see that my, my role morphs. And uh, okay. the one thing, the, the one group of people in the fire service that I've always had a fondness for are the fire photographers. Oh, cool. Uh, the craft that they bring in capturing and documenting uh, firemen in, in the performance of their work is uh, it's rare anymore. And in this area, we used to be flush and we had some, we were fortunate to have some pretty big names in, yeah. uh, in that, in that, in that field. And, uh, that's what I'd like to become to them because it's, it's important to a fireman to have their work documented and it's important to the department's history and their, their teaching aids, their, uh, the, again, documentation of, of, uh, his, history in the department and something that, uh, we don't have. So my relevance, uh, I hope is to develop into this fire photographer uh, role and support these guys in that fashion. And, and, uh, ah, there's some parallels good. there, man. You said before the word relevance keeps coming up and I love it because you said it before and I wrote it down, losing our relevance to the community back in 2004 or 2009, when you guys were going through the struggles and, and identifying the mission of the fire company and that you were losing relevance with the community and you now saying that you don't want to lose relevance with the fire company on your next chapter. 
There's a lot of parallels there. I think what that means is that you are just very much in tune with who you are and what you bring to the table. And I can tell you through the conversation today, Chief, I know you've made a great impact there and uh, and so on. So I they need you to keep coming in and have coffee, and they need you on the fire ground documenting what they do. The fact that you just said firefighters need their work documented, I couldn't agree with you more. That's huge. I, I appreciate that. I, I have to stress it over and over again. I know. I, I was not alone. Of course. These, these, I know that, not, but but you're a spokesman for it too, and yeah. you were the leader of that department, and they put you in that position because they felt that you could affect change and and the betterment of the department. So you're allowed to get a pat on the back, Chief. I, I promise it. you, just like the walkout ceremony they gave you, you're allowed to have that. And um, of course, it's not built solely on you, and that's recognized. But sometimes the most humble guys need a little uh, reassurance that uh, it's okay to take a bow every once in a while too. And you know, your work is certainly documented, and um, and I know so many speak very highly of you. So that's exciting. Forty seven, forty seven years old. What's next, man? I know you you mentioned a couple projects you got out there, but obviously you still want to stay very much in tune with the fire service. You ever think about speaking or talking about what? your experiences i think the episode today is very powerful and i think there's a lot of people that need to understand the process and and i think you could design something very powerful around the the idea of that volunteer to career and everything in between i think you bring a really interesting perspective because you lived it and i think you could be very valuable to a lot of people out there in talking about that topic no, I, I honestly, uh, I never thought of uh, taking that show on the road, for lack of a better word. Uh, yeah. I've, I've, I've actually struggled over the last couple of years with uh, the purpose of teaching because uh, in so many departments, you never see uh, the theory get turned into reality uh, for varying, varying levels of challenges and uh, or variables that exist within fire departments. And uh, but no, I never thought of, of doing that. Uh, our story is not unique. And as much as you think it is when you're in the trenches every day, you see a department 10 miles away uh, transitioning from an oil career department to a combination department. And they're quite literally in 2022, 23, walking down the same road that you did 12 years ago or the same road that our neighboring department did in you know 1995. And uh, it's, that's very frustrating to see because everything uh, – is at your fingertips outside of uh, you know, online or yeah, but, uh, through a, a myriad of sources outside of the classroom. But you know what I find interesting, and I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm maybe I'm way off the mark here or not. I don't know. But the attention span of people today. I mean, I'm starting to go through this process. I alluded to that a little bit uh, before. But what I'm finding is the attention span today and the buy-in today might not be what it used to be. And you know, in in your time frame, you had the right people with the right mindset. And I wonder sometimes organizations might swing out too far and it's hard to come back. And so when they have to make corrective measures, it's not done on the terms that it should be done on. And so I just wonder how different it is today in 23 than it was in 04, 05, 09. And, you know, what that does to the process. I think, you know, watching departments in similar situations, you know, a couple of years apart from another going through it, where I, where I think and what I was getting at with you is I think you bring a tremendous amount of value and perspective because you went through it. And and I'm a I'm a firm believer that training, right? You talked about theory to, to reality, right? But like training to me is not just the hands-on or the classroom. It's also the last 45 minutes of this podcast to me is training because the things that I've learned from you today and the things that I'd love to pick your brain about down the road, I bring, I think you bring tremendous value on because you've been there and that's training too, right? Is listening, shutting up, listening, and then asking a few educated questions to people that have gone through it. You can learn from that too. Yep. I, you make great points. Great points. <laughs> well, it's because I, I just, I, Part of my struggle with National Fire Radio Chief, and I'll be perfectly honest with you, is every guy that I interview is humble, right? And and we're all humble, but, like, I'm starting to realize that I need to start pushing people a little bit. And the people that I push are the ones that I really believe have a solid message that can do a lot of good for the fire service. And I think we need people navigating this space more than ever that are promoting the best parts of this job and pushing this job forward. And I think a guy like yourself, this isn't inflating ego. This is not, it's none of that. This is legit conversation. Guys that are super humble have a lot to offer typically to the job, but they're 
too humble to recognize that they can make an impact or a big difference on a bigger stage. And so the only thing I would say to you is think about the trials and tribulations you went through. I think you have a tremendous amount of uh, potential in front of you. And I think you could, you could specifically help a lot of people that are starting to navigate this space because from rural USA to the smallest towns, to the biggest towns and everything in between, everybody's struggling in the volunteer sector and you live this and you went through this. And I think the value you could bring is invaluable. And, uh, and so just, just think about that as time ticks on. Yeah, for sure. For sure. But I look forward to seeing what's next for you. Um, I'd love to take you, I want to take you up on a cup of coffee down there. I would love to see Penn Salkin firsthand. So I'd love to, to get something together with that. Um, just to, to see it firsthand because I have a lot of respect for you and your son and the department that you guys, uh, have and the, and everything that you went through to get to where you are. And I know reputation's important, right? And so for you leaving the job and knowing that the reputation of the Penn Salkin fire department is in a good place and it continues to grow now. Oh, absolutely. Um, again, the, the, the guys that are, uh, that have the, the helm now, uh, they're very focused and very dedicated. Uh, the department's actually growing in rank structure. Love We're that. putting, uh, we, uh, they're putting some uh, new members on in, in the full-time service this year. Uh, we're looking to evolve the, that volunteer staff company model that we have. And, uh, it's it's all in the on the framework that we set 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 on to uh, twelve years ago. Yeah. So, uh, framework. Uh, it's important. Yeah, it's it's uh, we we've we've evolved it. We're on our third uh, third you know oper- you know strategic plan for lack of a better word on what that framework looks like. And uh, I, I I wish them the best, and I hope I could be there for them in some capacity. But uh, um, to your to your to your request, the door's always open. <laughs> I appreciate and, uh, that. And we extend that offer to quite a few people, but uh, we're more than happy to extend that to you. And I'd love to. Uh, well, I just, just talked my way right that. in. You can't tell me no on the podcast. I mean, people are really like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that. I love it. Well, Chief, I, what a great topic and good conversation and. Um, Again, thank you. Thanks for sharing some of your story today with me. And um, it goes quick. Like I always say, the episodes go very fast. I feel like I could talk to you for hours, but I would certainly reach out down the road and pick your brain on a couple things that we're dealing with. And I think that you bring a lot to the table. Um, and uh, Please do. So, I, yeah. I, I, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be vulnerable and, uh, and share some of my, uh, my oh, story that. and it's been a, it's been a great experience. Well, and I think you're going to you're going to touch a lot of people with this. And um, and so that's great. And I look forward to seeing what's next for you. And and uh, and I challenge you to keep having those cups of coffee and keep educating those guys that are coming in and uh, and so on, because it does matter. And um, and so I, I look forward to our future dealings together, man. Thank you Thank so you, much. Sir. Thank yeah, you. absolutely. Chief. Thanks for joining me. Stay right here. I'm just going to sign off the podcast and then I'm going to come right back to you. OK. You got it. Great. Everyone, thanks for tuning in for another great episode of the National Fire Radio Podcast. Chief Joe Palumbo, senior out of Pensauk in New Jersey, recently retired. He's going through those paces of having a cup of coffee and educating the next generation. I love that. There's so much value in that. Remember, part of this conversation today was remembering where you come from. Keep those memories alive of where you come from because you can't go anywhere without knowing what your past was. And uh, thanks for tuning in. And do me a favor, take this conversation, take it back to the firehouse and talk about it because as we talk about the job, we are making the job better. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you at the next one. Jeremy, National Fire Radio. National Fire Radio.